there. This is the first Sunday of the year. You have chosen the right place to be on Sunday morning. And I am glad that you're here to worship with us today and start the year out right and just see what God has for us because I believe he has some great and glorious things for us. Amen? Appreciated uh, Gary's message last week. I, I was in church online uh, with all the crud going on, but he did a great job on preaching an open door before us. And Tim Strickland preached at the Magnolia campus on uh, how to start the year in, in the wisdom of God and dealt with just a great message on that. Both of those are a great preface to what I want to share today as we start this new year. I want us just to start it right. Uh, I remember as a young Christian asking someone that question early on, man, I'm just giving my life to Jesus. How in the world am I going to live a holy life? That was on my mind, by the way, all right? <laughs> I think that gets on our mind when we really get committed to Jesus. He said, well, it's just a day if you live a holy day. He says, if you'll take each holy day, you'll find out when you get to the end of your life, look back over your shoulder, it was, it was a holy life. So uh, let's have a holy year, amen? And it starts with today. And obviously, you should have started on the first, but if you haven't started yet, it's a good time to kick it in gear. And I think it's a great time for us to celebrate uh, the Lord's death and resurrection today as well. We'll have communion at the end of this, even hundreds of thousands of people being baptized over through the, through the denomination over the year that there was a decline in overall church attendance. And around 13 to 15% was the average in decline upon church attendance across the globe. Uh, we, we certainly experienced that ourselves this last year. Some of ours were what we would call by attrition. We've lost some precious people in our fellowship who've gone on to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And some hard replacements will have to be made over these next years. Uh, you know, just quality people in Jesus that we've lost and the Lord didn't lose them. We did, all right? He knows exactly where they are. They're in his care. But, you know, at the same time, you know, we have responsibilities as a church to be all that God has called us to be. And so today, I just want to challenge you uh, for this year. I, I don't have necessarily a sermon outline per se. I have some points I want to make. Uh, but I, just what's on my heart as the pastor of Believers Fellowship. 1988 was the start of our church had no idea where God would take us and what it would be through the years and all that God would do and how many lives would be touched, but it has been a, a blessed journey. It's had its ups, it's had its downs. Praise the Lord, it's had a lot more ups than it has downs. But even in the down times, and you'll discover this in your own life if you'll be patient with the Lord, even in the difficult times of your life, even in the difficult times of church, life, and family, when it seems to be times we have losses, you know, we experience loss in our life, just, just hold on, all right? Because the Lord has a way of trimming that which he wants to bear fruit. And even in John 15, Jesus is speaking. He says, you know, he said that those that are bearing fruit, he purges them, he trims them, all right? Just like the orchard care provides for the orange trees and trims them back annually for one reason, that it might produce more fruit. So nobody likes being cut, all right? Nobody likes the pains and the agonies and the stresses but God's got something he's doing in our lives. And if you follow the course of the way the Lord works in our life, oh, Paul put it this way, it's glory to glory. Sometimes there's a little gory in between the glory, but nonetheless, it is glory to glory. That God is about something in our church and God's about something in our life. So even though we might get frustrated with the decrease, it seems, it's always headed for an increase. If we stay true and we stay focused and we stay committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, it always gets back to him working in our life and him bearing fruit through us. The Bible says, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. And that's what God is up to in our heart and life. I thank God for his continual blessings in this church. I say it now and I say it often, I love this church. I love this church made up of some of the sweetest, nicest, greatest, most gracious people you will ever meet in all of your life. Go to Believer's Fellowship. You should know that. You see the ministry that takes place. You see the compassion that's carried out. You see the concern for other people. You see what God does in an interpersonal relationship. At the same time as experiencing outreach, you think over this last year how many lives have been touched and changed, how many homes and lives have been affected, and just how many people we have shared the Lord with who might not have come across the door yet, you know, who might not have entered the buildings yet, but yet their lives have been touched. Then we take outside that what God's done just on a global basis of all the ministries that have been carried out and all that's going to be carried out in the future. God's been good to our church, and we just need to stay faithful. My cry in my heart for the year is that we just dig in and be what God has called us to be. I have seen and I have witnessed 
the maturity of, of so many people's lives in this room. I've seen and witnessed our, our personal individual struggles, our strifes, and sometimes even our failures, which we hit a wall. But listen, God is a God of mercy, and God is a God of hope, and God is a God of grace, so don't give up on God moving in your life because God is up to something. All too often, we, we fall short and we bail out. The church, according to that report, on many levels is in decline. But I do believe that decline will lead to an increase for the churches that will be faithful to the Lord and be committed to the Lord and say, hey, I'm, on, I, I'm, I'm in this deal for the long haul, Jesus. I'm, I'm here to be what you called me to be. We are, bottom line, we are disciples of Jesus Christ. God has called us to be disciples. That means that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I have no reserve today telling Believers Fellowship Church to say, follow me, because I'm following Jesus. The apostle made it clear that's the way it's supposed to work. In your home, as a husband, as, 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 as a leader, as, as a parent, as a wife, it should be able to say to your family, hey, we're following Jesus, so stay on board, stay on course. Anytime we deviate from that, isn't it interesting how God has a way of correcting us and bringing us back to that? So let's, let's, let's be what God's called us to be, and let's be the disciples of Christ. How do you know disciples of Christ? Well, Jesus said, you know, you can tell because they're following me, all right? It's pretty simple. A disciple is somebody who's following. And so who are we following? Well, we're really not following Pastor Joe. We're following Jesus because I'm following him. The leadership is following him. <clears throat> the elders have their heart on following him. Our deacons have their heart set on following him. Our ministry leaders have their heart set on following him. So let's follow him. Now, the way I know if I'm following him, and it's not just religious verbiage, is because I am also making disciples. So this year, in 2019, it should be about you in your own personal walk. Who are you discipling? Who, who, who are you targeting in your life? Who, who are you focused on to bring them along in the journey? Whether it's a neighbor, whether it's a family member, whether it's with somebody at work, maybe the person down at Walmart, who knows? You do, all right? It's the person the Lord's telling you to speak to, address, invite, encourage. Now, I believe that everywhere we go, every day we ought to be handing out those invite cards, encouraging people to come to church. And if they can't come to our church, tell them to go to church somewhere, amen, to follow Jesus. But hey, this year, I think we just need to focus on, as a church, being those individual disciple makers. I, I sat with the pastors a couple of weeks ago, and I've talked to a lot of pastors over the last probably two months, probably more individual local pastors in this community than I have in the last two years. And uh, I'm friends with all these guys out here that are pastoring our local churches in the area and know most of them. But each and every one of them are saying to me, and, and, and Gary said on some of these meetings as well, saying to us, you know, our church is in terrible decline. You know, our church is declined. We've had a terrible year. It's been rough for us. 2018 was horrible. 2017 was not so good either. And we're facing these declines. And what do you think the problem is? Well, everybody has their opinions. Personally, I think is, and, and I, I shared this as a confession. You know, we've made a lot of disciples in our church who are stopping short on one final step in their walk in life. They're not disciple makers. One thing I appreciated about my mom and my stepdad, man, there were some disciple makers. Even after they were retired from the ministry, I still get calls from people and notes from people. In fact, our next trip to Israel, there were about six or seven people on that trip, as well as the last trip, that were some of their disciples, you know? People they just reached out to in life and, you know, continued to minister to and to draw in. They led them to the Lord. They led them into a faith walk with Jesus Christ. That should be every one of us, right? That we're making some disciples. We're, we're bringing people into the body. We're, we're building some relationships that, that are long-term, and we're affecting lives for the kingdom of God. I, I tell you, one of the great joys of heaven is going to really be, I hope for each and every one of us, just meeting people that we've impacted and seeing people there that maybe a long, long, long time ago you just planted a seed and never saw them again. But that part of your life, you know, it was an investment in somebody else's life. And then there's those others who we have known most of our life. We're just going to have some sweet fellowship. There's going to be some great times in Jesus, amen? And it's going to be an exciting time. And we stand before the Lord, first and foremost, the final word I think each and every one of us want to hear is, well done, thou good and faithful service. Come on into the joy of the Lord. That's the reason we do ultimately what we do is because, as we've said it before, we love God, we love God, we love God, and we love people. 
out of our love for God comes a love for people. You want 2019 to, to really be what God's called it to be, then I encourage you, if you didn't hear Gary's sermon last week, you go back and realize God's opened a door for you this year. God has opened a door for you this year. Where Paul said that God has opened a door of ministry, and I love what he said, there are many challenges. Hey, there are always challenges. I think those challenges are what defeat so many Christians in the process. You know, well, I wasn't expecting that. I didn't know that was going to happen. I didn't know they might turn on me. I didn't know it might be rejected. I didn't know it was going to be trouble. I didn't know I was going to have to do that. I didn't know I was going to lose that. And in that frustration, due to a lack of really having some biblical wisdom there and, and spiritual maturity, we kind of backed off and backed up. And we missed the mark of what the Lord was really wanting to do and what the Lord was really saying to us in that particular time. Listen, those hurts come in life. Those hurts come in ministry life. For you that are lift leaders, you know what I'm talking about. You know, things that people you've planted your life into and you've poured out your heart to. You know it in ministries on every level. People you've just, and, and then they just seem to just blow it off. That's God's business. You stay true to just being that disciple maker. There'll be some, you know, Jesus said it's like the, 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 the wheat in the field, you know, like the seeds that are being sowed. Some seeds are going to fall by the wayside. Some seeds are going to be received with gladness and not be the real thing. Some seeds are just going to, you know, fall among thorns, but the others are going to bear fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. That's a lot of fruit if you look that up, all right? The, just the smallest amount, the 30 fold, is a magnanimous amount of abundance. So what am I looking at in 2019 for our church? I'm just looking for all of us to be on board to the vision the Lord has given us. Every one of us. There shouldn't be anything happening around here that we're not a part of in some degree, whether it's the women's ministry or the ministry, ministry, ministry or youth or children. We're putting, we're putting in an investment of our life. We're helping them wherever the Lord leads us and whatever, however God guides us. It might be clothing. It might be food. But whatever it is, we're doing it for the glory of God. But that's in-house, outside. I can't use the word outhouse. That doesn't sound right, right? But in-house is one. But outside, out in the world, we're also living it. We're being diligent to, to speak, diligent to be courageous, diligent to open our hearts and our minds and life. There, we get to the end of 2019, this room will be full if we'll just do that. I'm serious. It's just, that's not a big task. That's not a big task, but it means... Everybody. It's one thing for me to do what God's called me to do, but I can't do what God's called you to do. And you can't do what God called her to do or him to do, but you certainly can do what God called you to do here and abroad. We love God and we love who? People. We love God and we love who else? People. God loves people. And we, in turn, have to have a heart and a commitment to loving people. Listen, I can't think of a better church to bring people to, by the way. <laughs> we're committed to Jesus. We're committed to the Word. We're committed to each other. We're committed to the things of God. We're committed to truth. Come on. We're, this, is, this is a good invite. There's something good going on here. God's, God's doing a deep work in people's hearts and lives. And how'd you get here, by the way? I think about that for a moment. How'd you get here? It wasn't an accident. Somebody spoke to you. Somebody encouraged you. Somebody may have witnessed to you. Somebody invited you. You know, very few of you are just walk-ins just out of the blue. Some, you were looking for a church home. You moved to the area. You left something. You came here. But whatever it was, you know, somebody in the whole process of you even getting saved, somebody was involved in that, you wouldn't be here. You, would, you wouldn't know the Lord if somebody wasn't involved. Somebody had to speak. Somebody was praying. It might have been great-great-grandma, you know, who when you were just a little baby still wet in your diapers was praying for you to come to Jesus one day, all right? Somebody was committed to pray for you. Somebody was committed to care for you. Somebody was invited, in, committed to love you. Who are you committed to? Who are you praying for this year? Who are you going to reach out to this year? Who are you going to just say, I'm going to step past myself and, and go do this? I think... I really believe we believe the lie that the world propagates, and really it's the devil because he's the father of all lies. They all originate with him, right? The lie goes something like this, and maybe you bought into it. 
Don't waste your time inviting people to church. Don't waste your time telling people about Jesus. They are not interested. Studies show the majority of people don't come because they're never invited. They don't get saved because nobody tells them about Jesus. Now, you have, we have to realize, yes, there's been, there's been an onslaught, you know, against the church in, as a whole in the world. I mean, we have 30, 40 years of a liberal controlled airways that are anti-God and anti-Jesus and anti-church and anti-Christian. I mean, look at the common movie that's been put out, and let's just Christian-based, and those never are the big million-dollar sellers, but most of the movies are slams against Christianity. You know, being sick and cough and all that kind of stuff. I, I was kind of bound at the house over the last week at times. I got in the office when it was open, but when I was home, I was just out, you know, and I'd turn on the, the boob tube, the idiot tube, you know. And I, I was really amazed because I probably watched more TV in that time than I had in a long time, but just movies and stuff, you know, on, on TV and they were on there and, and just amazed at how many movies have such a negative slant towards Christianity in general, you know, whether it's the church or whether it's the Bible, it's just another religious book. There's many ways. Most Christians are biased. They're judgmental. They're arrogant. Even the, even the, 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 the TV shows, like the, like all the talent shows, there's always some talent on there whose Christian parents were terrible, you know. And majority of those wouldn't have a talent show if it wasn't for the church to start with, amen, because 90% of them say, I grew up in church singing, and that's where they'll come out of. We just need to get our people back, amen. Give them back. But it's, there's such a, the way it's presented with such bias and such negativity, that's been going on for decades, in decades. And it's, it, it plants itself in people's brains. But when someone who's a child of God and loves Jesus, and they're not perfect, but man, there's, there's character about their life and there's light on their life and there's integrity. The world sees that. And I can tell you, unequivocally, without any doubt, that the world's looking for answers. Walk into any Barnes and Nobles. Walk into any bookstore. Three-fourths of it is the search for significance. What is life really? All? How can my life mean something? How to have a better life? How to have a better, more completed life? Listen, that book's already been written. <laughs> Amen. It's already been written. But the world has poo-pooed on it, so to say, right? They pushed it aside. We're the ones who are bringing it back into the light. We're the ones who are bringing it back into the conversation. We're the ones, oh, yeah, I know what the world says, but have you ever really read the Bible? Have you ever really thought about Jesus and what the Bible says about Jesus? Well, I've never really thought about it. But, but that's why I'm here, speaking of you. So don't buy into that lie. Because the truth of the matter is, and studies do show, that the Jesus method for reaching the world still works. What's the Jesus method? You die to yourself and you live for others. It still works. Go still works. Speak still works. Witness still works. Invite still works. Encourage still works. Help still works. Serve still works. Ministry still works. We just can't believe a lie. And I know at Believer's Fellowship, that's a bell we ring often. Amen? It's not like you're not reminded of this often at church, right? Anybody heard this, this before? Yes. I think we get dull of hearing. We get a little dull of hearing. Oh, we heard it, we heard it, we heard it. And so it doesn't, it doesn't resound with us like it should. It doesn't echo in our hearts the way it should. In fact, when we hear it sometimes, we, we build up a resistance, we put up a wall, and we don't go. And, and the reason we're not advancing and really discipling is because we've, we've developed this resistance. This Jesus talks about hard to heart. So we, we've used the terminology in agriculture, we develop what's called a plow pan. All right? We only let the Lord dig so deep on us now, all right? When, when the soil has to be broken at different layers over different years, or what happens is you get one hard subsurface, and that's called a plow pan develops. So you've got to dig a little deeper this next year, all right? You've got to let the Lord's furrows, the Holy Spirit, pull a little bit more dirt back, expose a little more of the fertile soils of your heart. Let the seed of God take a little deeper root in your life this year. Get a little more committed to the obvious things, like your faith your love for Jesus, 
your belief that God is in charge of things. It'll overcome the fears and the doubts you're facing this year of the struggles. And oh, what if this happens? And what if that happens? And what about this? Hey, must that stuff never going to happen to start with? Amen? Unless you just sit and create it by your own fears and doubts. You just make it happen ultimately. Someone said, you know, worry and fear have babies. <laughs> so get them out of the house. They're like kittens that hadn't been spayed. They'll just make a lot of other cats. You have more cats than you know what to do with. Can I get a witness from the cat people at least? <laughs> so let God do that deeper work in your heart and your life this year. Come back to that place. I'm believing God for this year. I'm going to trust the Lord this year. Yeah, it's been difficult. It's probably one of the most difficult years of my life. But hey, I'm moving forward because whatever God cut off, he's just going to blossom more. And he's going to bring forth great fruit from it if I'll just hold on. You know, we have that, that, our famous statement out of, the, out of the book of Esther. It's what, for such a, for such a time as this. That, that, that phrase we developed back in 1988, we took it out of the scripture. And back at the very beginning days of the church, that statement was what we were about. But when you look closer at that book, that was in a difficult time of desperation, if you remember the story. The Jews are getting ready to be annihilated. Haman is a wicked man. He hates the Jews. He hates God. He hates the, the vehicle through which God is manifest at that time, which was the Jewish people. They were the means by which the, the, the message of, of God would be distributed. And so let's get rid of it, like culture today. We have our own Haman, all right? There's still things that aggressively don't like what we do. I mean, there are whole organizations today fueled by billions of dollars simply seeking to silence the Christian voice in this world and especially in our country. Just their, that's their aim. That's what they're all about. So it's a time where there's a great threat going. And you know the story. Haman's over here threatening. There's beautiful Esther. She's a good-looking woman, all right? She wouldn't be where she was if she wasn't a good-looking woman. So God gave her her good looks for a reason at that time and put her in that time period right when he wanted her, right where he wanted her, and now she's in the palace. She's succeeding, uh, coming up after the queen before her, which was murdered because she spoke when she shouldn't have spoke. Aren't you glad things have changed a little bit, ladies? And so, at least in this country. So she, she, she's there, just enjoying the luxury of the palace. Kind of like church today, you know. She's just enjoying the blessings. But when God never blesses us as the end all. He blesses us to be the blessing. He blesses us to be blessers. You've been blessed so you can return that blessing. You're the warehouse, as we've said before, of distribution. So Mordecai... Uncle Mort comes in and says, hey, it's time to come out of your closet, come out of your hiding place, and speak on behalf of God's people and on behalf of the, of, of the Lord. Uh, 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 uh. Esther, here's the way one translation puts it. You were born into royalty for such a time as this. Well, she got that by... A, coming into the royalty, being accepted. And it's like a birth of a new life for her, basically. Hey, we have been birthed into royalty. <laughs> Amen. We're children of the king. There's no higher king, all right? You might be strutting around saying that your uncle's President Trump. Big deal. My father's God. All right? We've been birthed into the kingdom and into royalty for this time. God could have chose to put you somewhere else on the planet at some other time in his sovereignty. Could he not? I mean, the Bible says, that according to scriptures, he fashions you in your mother's womb. He could have fashioned you 100 years ago. That's getting close for some of us. <laughs> he could have fashioned you next year. He could have done it back in the 1700s or even during the time of Christ, you know? That could have been where you were, but he didn't. He saved you for this moment. I mean, literally saved you for this moment. He created you in this time, you were birthed in this time, and you were birthed where you were birthed. You could have been born in Cuba. You could have been born in Russia. You could have been born in Africa. I don't know where you are, but he birthed you geographically where he birthed you. 
And then he has you here right now in this time of, of time and space, in this window, in this place for now, for his kingdom. You are where you are by the grace of God. I love Major Ian Thomas. He's a British theologian from years back. He said, you know, he says, you know, uh, I'm put. He says, I'm doing what God called me to do. You know, he said, I have a simple theology in life. Sent, went, and put. God sent me. I went where he sent me, and I'm put. I'm going to do where, what I'm supposed to do where he put me. In other words, bloom where you planted is what my mama used to say. You need to bear fruit where you planted. Don't be whining and say, well, I'd just rather be in Dallas today. Well, bless your heart, you're not. And you ought to thank God for that. I've been there. <laughs> I was born there. Lord, move me here. All right. Hey, God has you here. Well, I need a bigger house. If you, God wants you to have a bigger house. If you need a bigger house, you really do need a bigger house, he'll get you a bigger house. The issue is not your circumstance. The issue is just doing what God called you to do here. Great story that's in, in Genesis and Joseph's life. Look at Joseph. He's despised by his brother. He goes to the pit. He's thrown in the pit, sold into slavery. He goes to Potiphar's house, from the pit to Potiphar's. There he has a terrible time. He's, at the beginning, things are great. In fact, God so blesses Joseph in a bad situation called slavery, he excels in that situation and becomes master of Potiphar's house. From there, he goes to prison. Falsely accused, it happens. People lie about you. Get over it. People say things about you that are not true. People have been doing that to you or me and others all their li our lives. Amen? People tell you stuff about you. It's not right. And so there he goes to prison. You know what happens in prison? If you follow the story, he's pretty much in charge of the prison before he leaves. He's over things. No matter what the circumstances, he's like cream rising to the top. David Jeremiah talked about a little bit this, this morning. But it just really planted a seed in me about, you know, hey, no matter the circumstances, God will use that for his glory. You will rise. You know, it'll come up because you're a child of God. If you'll seek to say, I'm going to glorify God wherever. He goes from the, from, from the prison to the palace. Now, there's a sermon outline, pit, Potiphar's, prison, and palace, all right? <laughs> but that's where our life is. That's the way it works for all of us. We're going to go through things in life. Why? So that right there, wherever we are, no matter what we're having to do, or, or endure even, the glory of God can be manifest so we can make a difference in the world around us. I think God wants to do some great things in our church and in our life, but we're going to have to come to the to, to a realization that Pastor Joe can't do it alone. Crystal can't leave the youth alone it takes every one of us Matthew can't lead the children's ministry Erica can't lead the, the, the nursery ministry alone and that's not what God called us to do in fact God calls leadership to teach people how to do the work of the ministry now I thought this would be a really awesome day for us to share in communion together but here's the link in 1 Corinthians 11 we'll read from in a moment Paul is addressing the church at Corinth about the Lord's Supper and about communion. He said, in the night that the Lord's would pray, I received from the Lord. And the, he, the Lord showed him everything that took place in that room that night. But remember, we, when we study the Bible, we use this word context. You know, whenever you're doing a Bible study lesson or studying the Bible, remember, context, context, context. That's the way it works. Always remember the context of what's going on. There is an application. There's eternal principles that are involved in that context for us today. But let's get back to the context. The context, Corinth was going through all the motions of the church, but their hearts were not right. Some were living in morality. Many of them, the worst sin of all of it, was the division, the animosity, the strife within the fellowship. Brothers, sisters, angry with each other, not talking to one another, not being concerned about one another. So, in chapter 11, if you start the first of the chapter and all the way through the first of the book, because in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about their carnality. They're just selfish, you know. And so he's dealing with it. And then he comes to this apex of all this stuff, this disunity and this disloyalty and this, this lack of, of serving one another and this lack of serving God. He comes right to the Lord's Supper. He says, I want to remind you what Jesus has done for us. 
I want to remind you of the sacrifice of Christ. I want to remind you that he, as he said, he died for the church. He died for us corporately as a people. That God's way of reaching the world in these last days would be us, the church. And Jesus said, Lord, I pray to you, my Father in heaven, I pray to you that they would be one as we are one and the world will believe. The more unity we can express and the more unity we can discover and the more love for each other and the more service to one another that we understand and we participate in and we carry out, then the more our lost world will believe us. All too often, too many churches are just, you know, gossiping about one another or putting one another down or saying things behind each other's back. And, you know, you you just lose the unity of the Spirit. So understand, when Paul's writing this, what's he talking about? Disunity. You know what he does in chapter 12 and 13? Y'all who study Corinthians, he starts to deal with specifically right where he left off, the body, the body, the body, the body, the members of Christ, the gifts of the Spirit. Operate in your gift. Discover your gift. Operate in your gift. Serve the Lord. So I think as we talk about a challenge of our body for 2019, I want communion is the perfect thing to conclude our service with because we have to understand the body. That it's not a pastor, it's not Brother Gary's job, it's not Brother Joe Tim's or whoever's job. It's our job to build the church, to grow the church, to mature the church, to win people to Christ. And folks, please understand, you might be thinking, well, Brother Joe just wants more people. (laughs) God wants more people, all right? Blame him for that, for he certainly does. But it's people, not numbers. Do you understand the difference? Because what you're thinking, if you're saying it, it's just numbers. More numbers. more, And you judge everything by numbers. Lots of numbers take good service. Not a lot of numbers. Bad service. Don't give away your immaturity. <laughs> All right? Numbers are people. We talk about the importance of our guests in our service. If you're visiting our church, we don't look at you as a, adding another number or two or three to the church. You're a soul. You're a person. We love people. We love God. We're in, we want to invest our, our lives in your lives and your lives in our lives. We want to grow together in the kingdom of God. Reach a lost world for the kingdom of God. But it takes all of us. We all share. We all care. We all invite. We all witness. We all pray. We all give. We all speak. We all come the church. Jesus died for the church. One guy said, well, I'm not really interested in the church. Well, throw half your Bible away. Because half of it, the New Testament, more than half, three-fourths of it deals with the church. Well, I don't go to a local church. I'm part of the invisible church. (laughs) You're the invisible member. (laughs) You know, 90% of the times when he's talking about the church, it's not dealing with the universal church. He's talking about a local church fellowship that we commit to and we're a part of. And we find our place of ministry and service there. So I'm praying this year, 2019, that each of us kind of come back to that understanding because I think it's something we already know in our head. But we get dull of hearing and come back and say, hey, how can I serve the Lord? I love God and I love people. So how can I serve the Lord? It is a time of desperation in the world that we're living in. It was then. It also speaks not only of desperation, it speaks of destiny, death to self. It speaks of determination. All those things are part. But doesn't this also, communion? A time of desperation, all men were lost without any hope, and Jesus Christ came and died in that time of desperation. It was his destiny. It was his purpose. He said, I come to do my Father's will. I've accomplished what the Father sent me. It was a time of destiny. This is the time of destiny for us to do the Father's will. But it will take dying. It'll take dying. I mean, there's some things that the Lord may want you to die to this year. It may be a hobby. It may be a time waster. You know, it may be something that you might like, but you waste too much time with it. You know? Nobody going to volunteer on that one? (laughs) It might be a preoccupation. You know? It could be a sport. You know? I I know some people, they're just so committed to to football, man, they got to make the games or baseball, the kids got to be there. But hey, if that's above Jesus, you need to dial it back. You need to dial it back. 
If business is more important than church, you can dial it back. So I won't make as much money. So what? Life's not about making more money. Somebody ought to say it louder. Life's not about making more money. <laughs> Amen. It's about making a difference. Being that difference maker in your life. But it will take, as with Jesus, it said, he set his face toward Jerusalem. We have to set our face towards God and his will and purposes for our life. We can't let things distract us. We come back to that place of faith and obedience to the Lord. I want you to stand with me. We're going to share in the Lord's Supper together. I'm going to begin by reading a passage of Scripture together with us as we honor the Lord from 1 Corinthians, the passage that I just mentioned. And then after that, I'll have you be seated and the ushers will prepare to start serving the Lord's Supper because there will be about a two-minute video I'm going to show you. But during that video, I just want you to prepare your heart to remember all that Christ has done for you. But let's read this passage. He says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. If we just judge ourselves correctly, rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we're disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. In other words, saying, if there's sin in your life, confess it. Jesus died to take away our sins. Why are we still toting them around? Why are we still holding on to things? He goes on to say here. Oops, back up. Back up one second. Can you freeze that for me? But if we're judged, it's an important thing that we judge ourselves. Because if we don't, and by judging, he said, be willing to look in it and assess the damages you're doing with sin in your life and put it on the cross where Jesus died to forgive you. And then he says, we should rightly discern the body. What does that mean? Remember what he, the context of this passage? Was the believers in Corinth and their relationship to the other believers and their responsibilities in the body of Christ. Would you be willing to assess that today where you are? In your part of the kingdom work? You're part of kingdom service, and you're part of the disciple making, disciple building. We don't want to be condemned. And not that you lose your salvation, but you lose your rewards that God has for you. Somebody say amen to the reading of the word. You may be seated. We start that now. If you'd stand to your feet, I think it's important as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, let's just take a moment before him. There's something that the Lord has spoken to you about, not just today, maybe this year, the Lord's been doing about the same thing and you haven't responded yet. Don't carry that into this year. Leave it at the cross. Surrender it to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have aught against some brother, sister, Maybe a family member. Don't carry that into this year. Lay it at the cross. God knows how to handle those things. You're going to have to let him. You're going to have to let God handle it. For you to move in any other way will not only be a failure, it'll open the door for further failure in your life. So as we pray, if you'd like to come to the altar, we're going to take about two minutes of time here. You can come. Just lay it before the Lord. You want to just kneel right where you are. You have some decision. Maybe you want somebody to pray with you. Pastor Gary and I will be up here. You can come to either one of us. We'll have a word of prayer with you this morning. But let's just take this brief moment in time and prepare our hearts for this morning. We begin in a moment to receive the Lord's Supper.
let's just be submissive and open and tenderhearted to our Heavenly Father. Foot of the cross, where grace and suffering meet, you have shown me your love through the judgment you received, and you've won my. Father, we do bring all these things to you. We bring this year and put it on the altar before you. We bring our lives. Help us to understand that as we lay down our life and we're willing to make the sacrifice and present ourselves as a living sacrifice, that's where life begins to abound, not only for others, but even for us. In Jesus' precious name. Somebody say amen. You may be seated. Amen. You may be seated. These gentlemen, in a moment, we'll pass the elements out to you. According to the scripture, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he passed it out to his disciples. As we pass this out to you today, we're going to ask you to, to do the same thing. That you would take this piece of bread and take it out of the tray and pass it to the person beside you. But as you do so, let's remember, this is a time of taking everything else out of our heart and mind and exalting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So take the bread from the tray and hold on to it for a moment, and then we'll receive it together with, with a word of thanksgiving. Nails in your hands, nails in your feet, you show me how much you love me. Thorns on your brow, they tell me how you pour so much shade. 
we remember as we take this bread into our hand, the Bible says that Jesus broke this unleavened bread, and he said, this is my body. Today the Lord declares that we are his body. And if we'll stay humble and broken before the Lord, committed to our love to him, and our love for a lost world, no end to how God will use each and every one of you in a unique and a very special way. So let's remember Jesus and all that is in his heart and all that is mine to redeem us and to change us and to make us his bride. That's how much he loves us. How much, how much he loves me, how much he loves you. So as we take this bread, let's remember Jesus. And let's give thanks as he did. Lord, as we lift this bread up, we realize all the symbolism on the, the beauty of the picture itself. But more than that, Lord, we remember you who declared you're the bread that comes down from heaven and that you literally gave your body, which this represents, to create this new body, your bride. Help us to receive this with humility as you carried out your Father's purposes. We take this bread, and Father, we thank you for it. We thank you for Jesus. And Holy Spirit, how can we say thank you enough for opening our eyes and leading us to the cross. And Jesus, we remember you today for all you've done for us and giving your body for us. In Jesus' name, we eat this in remembrance of you. Would you take and eat in remembrance of Jesus? You know, eating in Scripture is always an act of symbolism of of faith, where we're, we're taking him in, we're believing him, we're trusting him. It's the same as we did with the bread. I'll ask you to take the cup, pass it out amongst you, and then hold it and we'll receive it together. If you look in that cup, what you're seeing there is 100% unadulterated grape juice. <laughs> but what better picture to represent the 100% 
unadulterated, untainted by sin, the precious blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's the reason we don't use fermented wine for the Lord's Supper, because his blood wasn't fermented, which means spoiled. There's no spoiling. It was pure blood. Oh, precious is the blood. Makes me white as no, no other blood could do that. My blood couldn't do that. Yours couldn't. Only the blood of the spotless Lamb of God. We thank him today for making the sacrifice of his blood. It had to be drawn. He had to be nailed to a cross. A spear pierced his side, thorns on his brow. Suffering brought forth the blood. Every drop poured out for you and for me that we could come to a place of life, and liberty, and celebration, but even greater to be part of a kingdom, to be part of the bride of Christ, to celebrate our communion with him and our communion with each other. So as you look at this cup today, remember the high price of our salvation, the precious holy blood of Jesus Christ. What a God and what a Savior. Father, we do give thanks. We know that Jesus in that night in the upper room took the cup and said, this is my blood, the new covenant shed for you. And he lifted that cup up and it says he gave thanks. Lord, we give thanks. We thank you, Father, again for sending Jesus to bankrupt heaven on such a level that your own son had to come and shed his blood for us. And Holy Spirit, again, we thank you for helping us to understand the depth of that great love that the Father has. And Jesus, how can we say thank you enough? We will do what you told us to do. We'll remember you today in this communion time. But more than that, we'll remember you by obedience and by love as we commit our day this month, this year, our gifts, our church, our service, our ministries to you. May you be glorified in us. I ask you in Jesus' name to bless our fellowship, Father, with your grace. I ask you to take the cup now and drink in remembrance of Jesus Christ. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's stand together. In a moment, you can leave the cup on the seat or there'll be some trash cans in the lobby. On the way out, you can place them in there. But let's sing that chorus again. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow? Oh, no I know nothing but the blood of Let's sing it again. Oh, precious is the flow. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No, no other. Nothing but the blood. Hallelujah. Nothing but the blood of But the blood Jesus. Somebody say amen and thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> amen. You may be seated next Sunday morning, same time. We're having a celebration service, all right? So join us, bring someone with you, use the invite cards, fulfill the ministry in your heart and life that God has given you. Be blessed and be glorified in that process because that's exactly what he'll do. He will bless and continue to glorify himself through your life. There's no greater place of privilege. Our hearts continue to go out for those in our church family. This has been a difficult year. We've lost some great, precious folks this last year. And even at the beginning of this year, and Linda and Samuel and Carla and, you know, Sam, others, you know, the Bonds, Mark lost his mom this last week. Bill Agali, his brother-in-law. I mean, it's been, a, it's been a difficult time. And, you know, it's, our hearts go out to you. Your church family loves you. We're here for you. We want you to know that uh, you're, you're not alone. You probably feel terribly alone at times, but you are loved and cared for, and our prayers have not stopped for you in this process. There are others who are suffering, who are sick this time. You remember Stephanie's grandmother, continue to pray for her. Uh, you have someone in your family. It's just amazing to see 
you know, this, this, this process of dying and losing is soon to be over. <laughs> Amen. The circle will be finalized on the other side. It won't be broken there. Amen. So let's look forward to the days ahead and praise God for the mercy and grace he's given. But our hearts go out over this last year and the beginning of this year. So many had so much terrible losses in their lives. We do love you. Your church prays for you and has continued to lift you up. Anything we can do, please let us know. Are you excited about 2019, though? Buckle down. It's going to be a glorious year. We're going to see God do some great things. All in all, with the difficulties last year, we still saw supernatural, marvelous ministries that took place through our fellowship. Let's continue to glorify God and be used by God this year on a greater level than that. The church in America may be declining. We've had a small decline. We are not dead. Hallelujah. <laughs> Don't count us out. Hallelujah. We're about great things for the kingdom of God. Brother Gary's got a few closing announcements. Amen. Asked uh, Tammy Jaquette if she can come up. She has an announcement to make about the Hope Luncheon. Hello. I'm here to talk about the Women's Hope event we got coming up on Saturday, January 19th from 1030 to 130. It's here at our spring campus. And the purpose of this event is to identify your spiritual gifts and how we can take those and connect them into one of our ministries. So I want to thank Pastor Joe for leading me into this. But um, we are going to um, ask the ladies to bring a potluck soup or a stew. It cost us $5. We do have child care, but please let us know so we can get you registered. And I'll be outside the doors here with some forms to fill out, and we'll ask you to either place them in the receptacles or you can hand them to me. And um, if you... Uh, one more thing. When you think about hope, I just want you to think about where is your hope and how can you spread that, like Pastor Joe said. You know, you think, how can I have hope? We have hope because we're believers, my friend. We have hope after life. We have hope because God is with us in this valley. God is with us on this mountain. God is with us all the time. We have that hope, and we need to share that with other people, right? We have that. It's a gift. Don't keep that gift to yourself. So please come. I'm looking forward to seeing you and meeting you. Thank you. Amen. Crystal's going to come on up. She's going to recap our youth lock-in. Um, yeah, uh, first of all, I survived. <laughs> Next Sunday, my, I might have fully recovered. We'll see. Um, but we had a really good time. We had 27 kids. Um, which is really amazing. A lot of those were visitors. Amen. Um, really good time in the Lord. Um, Jordan and Trevor brought an awesome word. Um, the kids were super receptive. Um, it was really amazing. I think maybe we should give them a Sunday or something. Amen. I mean, future preachers, I think. They were amazing. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you for those who invited kids. Um, and don't stop inviting um, if it, it doesn't have to just be an event for you to invite um, youth to church because, you know, that's the future of our churches. Um, and I think that, you know, where we're seeing a decline in our church services, we are also seeing that in our youth services. And we don't want that because, um, you know, these are our future, you know, soul winners. Um, and so don't stop inviting them. It was really amazing. We had a lot of fun. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for those who helped. Amen. They did have a great word. Um, and if they ever, if you ever get to hear them, those two just gelled. It was just incredible. And I'm going to steal something that they said. They had everybody write on a note card what they thought of themselves, right? And then they went over their points. And at the end, they said, flip your card over. Now write, you are worth, uh, you are worth dying for. So every time you're down and you think of yourself one way, remember, God thought of you so much that you're worth dying for. So that was just a great word. So thank you on that. You, uh, don't miss, uh, no, tonight's the, today's the last day, the last Sunday for our Christmas mission offering. Um, we are around $21,000, so that's a praise, amen. But don't think it's, you've missed your opportunity if you haven't given Today is the last Sunday to give to that offering, and so let's just do something uh, just special this year for 2019. God has really opened the doors for just the world and, and given Believers Fellowship an opportunity to be 
in a lot of different places. So just just honor the Lord with that. Don't miss, uh, don't forget to come on Wednesday night. Uh, don't think that it's just for the, the 10 or 15 people that, that are coming. I mean, it's for anybody and everybody. We're actually starting a new lesson. It's on uh, the le- Paul's letter to the Romans. We kind of set the foundation last week. This week, we're going into, into it deep. And remember, you know, Paul has the three I am's, you know. I am eager, I am capable, and I am not ashamed. And so we're going to talk about that this week. So it's a great opportunity to get into, to really dive deep and, and, and unpack the, the book of Romans. Ladies Bible study, the Apostles' Creed starts this Thursday at 7 p.m. or next Tuesday morning at the 15th at 10 a.m. Both will be held in the fellowship hall. Um, E-blast prayer forms. If you do not receive our weekly e-blast or prayer request and you would like to be added to our list, please fill out the appropriate section of the form and place it in the offering boxes uh, and the forms are located in the lobby. Uh, before I get into the offerings, our, in the kitchen, our, our food pantry has been blessed. We have yogurts, dairy products, frozen foods, frozen pizzas. So please go by the kitchen area. There are a lot of, there's a lot of food in, in, in there. Again, yogurts and dairy and frozen food. So you, you have not because you asked not or you don't walk down to the kitchen. So please go to the kitchen and just grab something. Um, Finally, we do not pass a, a plate around here. We have offering receptacles in the back. Um, be sure to honor the Lord as, as he honors you and, and or blesses you, and it's an opportunity just to continue to worship him. If you are a guest of ours, our pastor would enjoy the opportunity again to visit with you. So you take that, that welcome card. Uh, go, I'd ask you to go to the Welcome Center, and there he will meet you, greet you, and give you a free gift. Don't forget our services tonight, Awana's Youth Lift. With that being said, you are dismissed. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your stream.